joining us from uh, various places. I, I appreciate you taking your time today uh, to learn about PCI 3.1 and what it means to your organizations. I want to thank Palladian for putting this on. Uh, and if you get a chance, uh, go check out their new website. They did a, uh, some new branding. It's a sleek uh, new design. Go check it out. It looks uh, really good. It's Palladian.net. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We're going to talk about PCI 3.1, uh, the changes that occurred. Uh, they actually, PCI 3.0 uh, ends its life today. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about why those changes happened and uh, how to keep your company compliant. And if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, please feel free to uh, chat them over. And uh, we may ask you some questions along the way. So let's go ahead and get started. First off, uh, this is our host today. It's Palladian Networks. If you are, are not familiar with Palladian, they are, have been in the industry about 15 years. They uh, do everything as far as data security that you can possibly imagine. They secure smaller uh, businesses all the way to large enterprise organizations. So they're a good firm to, to get to know. And if you have questions about them, please uh, chat them over and we can uh, get back with you later. So today the, the topic is PCI 3.1 and the changes. Why these changes happen, what the changes actually do as far as security, and uh, what those changes mean to your company, which really the business impact is, is really the goal of the council. As, as, as far as being a positive impact, but also what those costs and things will mean to your company uh, moving forward. So 3.0 uh, didn't last very long. Uh, it, it changed uh, very quickly. And as you see here, the slide is uh, showing you the PCI uh, cycle of um, the standard. So right here on the screen, I, I don't really need to read it to you. But this is the, the, the life cycle of uh, the different standards. And you can see there, there's uh, different uh, nuances to it. We have the community meetings, which we're about to start um, up, and they're on there three times. And why are they on there three times? Well, it's a three-year cycle. Um, so 36 months, and so far we've had PCI version one, two, three, and 3.1 with some other updates uh, scattered in between there. Um, this is a good thing to know because as you do your audits, if you are doing a 2.0 audit and then you find out next year you have to do a 3.0 audit and it, the price has gone up, well, you need to understand why. You also need to understand what those standards uh, mean to your business as usual posture as well as what it will mean for your data security, uh, especially uh, regarding to your employees, policy procedures, documents. So it's a lot of things to, to have to know. All right, so why do we change? Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, everything changes. Uh, the world around us is changing. Um, some things we did five years ago we don't do now. Uh, some things that we're doing now we didn't even dream of 10 years ago. I, I uh, just had a conversation with a, a family member this morning, and uh, we were talking about uh, email and phone and internet and all those good things. And, uh, you know, I, as I got off the phone with them, I realized, wow, um, 20 years ago, I, I didn't do any of those things. Uh, we, we didn't really email. We had the internet in my house just because my father worked in, in the computer world, and it was nothing like what you see now. So the same thing holds true for any technology. It changes, it evolves, and because of that, Threats evolve. When you make a new, uh, when you make something new, at the same time you could possibly uh, make a vulnerability, and that's usually what happens. Also, too, uh, one of the things we talked about on the call this morning was uh, passwords. About uh, in in the early 90s, it would take uh, about three months to crack a seven-digit password. Uh, now there's apps that do it in minutes. So that's why you have uh, passwords that need to be changed every three months, uh, seven to uh, that are seven to ten characters long. 
So there's a lot of things that need to be updated, and so I won't go for too far into that, but let's talk about some of the things that have gone on. We've seen uh, a myriad of data breaches. You can't go a week without hearing about a new one. And these aren't just small companies. We're talking about larger companies that are feeling the impacts of data breaches. And some of the reasons are here. There's poor implementation of current standard. That is a possibility, lack of awareness. Uh, in your organization, you need to have someone who takes control of PCI, and they should be an executive or at least have a executive backing to where uh, people can't just blow them off. Uh, so that person would be involved in PCI awareness. Uh, a quick straw poll, if any of you are brave enough to, to say it, if you're in charge of, of uh, PCI, we're going to ask a little bit later for your organization, but uh, are you doing annual training? Um, the testing that needs to be done to your system, are you testing the proper systems? Uh, are you looking at the data controls and saying, okay, this is something that really applies to us and then we need to focus on it? Another big uh, part of understanding PCI is what data needs to be protected and how important is it? Are you making some kind of graph showing, okay, this data we absolutely positively cannot ever get out. It needs to be protected with more vigorous uh, controls than other ones. So these are all things that need to be looked at and uh, checked out as, P as you look at PCI. And as uh, the bottom of the slide here talks about lack of ownership, um, we kind of covered that earlier, but really uh, this needs to be spearheaded by someone in the top levels of, the, of your company and then uh, maintained with a, with a well thought out plan. And, and let me stop for a second and, and, and go back to something. Let's think of PCI kind of like we do as a Q-tip. The Q-tip's real name is the cotton swab. Okay? Um, the reason why we call it Q-tip is because that's the name that we've gotten used to. When people say PCI, then you'll hear them say, oh, well, we're talking about fraud or, or data security. It's all of those things. It's people, processes, and technology married together that create your company's security posture. And that's what we're really talking about. How are you protecting assets? Some of these assets are tangible, maybe a cash drawer. But other assets we're talking about could be intellectual property. It could be customers' information, credit card information, your employees' information. So when we're talking PCI, I want you to, when you hear me say that, I want you to really think data security. What is, how am I protecting data? Okay, so um, version 3.1 is definitely an improvement over 3.0 and 2.0. Um, one of the things that really uh, stuck out with me with 3.1, when 3.0 came out was, hmm, they're not really talking about SSL, TLS, and we had seen a number of breaches and, and they corrected that with 3.1. As you can see on the slide, I, I'm not really big into reading slides to you because I'm sure all of you can read them, um, but there really isn't a change to the, to the essay, the, QSA, which is a Qualified Security Assessor Assessment Process, but um, there also should there are some changes, and we're going to look at them more closely right now. They're classified in the, into two different kinds of changes. But look here, this is a uh, this is what 2.0 looked like, and basically it was: is this in place? Yes. Not in place? No. And if it's not in place, when are you going to have it in place? Not 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 too much to it. Pretty straightforward. Uh, do you have a firewall? Yes. Uh, if you don't, no. When are you going to have it? Uh, then you look here, and you'll see 3.1, and it's going to give you a requirement. It's giving you a testing procedure. So do you have a firewall? Let's test see if you do. And it's going to give you guidance on it. It's going to look at it and say, this is really what we're looking for. And I thought this was uh, very, a very good idea, especially for smaller companies or companies that don't uh, haven't taken the time to really dive into PCI and look at it, because now you have an idea of what you're looking for, and it's kind of giving you um, some assistance where sometimes you're left to your own devices and people don't do the research to find out. So you see right here, it's going to give you some guidance. Say, hey, this is what we need. This is what you need to have in place. Now here, uh, 3.1. 
we're going to look at. Uh, all right, one second here. Okay, so how should this be applied? Um, I'm I'm going to tell you something. It's a conversation I had uh, with a couple vendors not that long ago, and a couple uh, merchants at a trade show recently. PCI is all about your security posture for your company. You need to make sure that all of the activities, and you'll see this a couple bullet points down, can be done in a business as usual context. This needs to just be something that you're doing consistently. Security is all about consistency. Are you going to stop every hacker from getting in? No. But knowing when that hacker got in and knowing what they got to is far more important than trying to stop everyone. It's all about being able to respond to the incident or to identify that there is an incident. And that is why you have data breaches that go on for such lengths of time. It's because the, the actual entity that is uh, being compromised is, has, has not for some reason identified that there is a breach and then taken the steps to take care of it. So when you look at PCI, I don't want you to think, oh, I'm going to have to do all these things that don't fit into my business plan. The best way to do is to work with a QSA or a, a, a consultant that will help you incorporate PCI into your daily operations. Okay? So big, big, big point there. Make sure that this is business as usual. And validation isn't a, a one-time-a-year uh, event, right? So the the points that came up on this are the, the classification of the changes. And there's clarification, um, and you can read these right here, right? Additional guidance, which are some new, and, uh, and evolving requirements. I, I think the one that you need to take take a look at and, and pay most attention to are the clarific well not one that you need to take more attention to but if I had to if I had to say you make sure you're paying attention to this it would be the additional guidance and the clarification there's a lot of um, of, of misunderstood PCI requirements one of them has been pen testing which they did a special interest group or SIG to really uh, delve into and come up with some good uh, guidance on that but there's also other things, um, especially for small businesses, things of that nature, additional guidance. And the PCI Council actually put together a committee uh, made up of about 20 or so companies that are focusing on small to medium business um, and, and their needs as far as uh, data security and PCI. So. Uh, these these changes here are going to be very important, and you're going to see more of them in the uh, months and in years to come. So, okay. So when you go and pull up the PCI security standard, uh, you see right here we have a version 3.0. Uh, surprise, surprise, there's a new one, and that's 3.1, and that's what we're talking about. Um, there's a lot of uh, confusion about what PCI is to uh, different companies or what SAQ self-assessment questionnaire, what documentation they need to use, what a PADSS is. Uh, there's a glossary on the main page which has terms. And uh, those terms are something that whoever's in charge of PCI for your industry, for your company, uh, should become very familiar with. And also anyone who has to do any anything that involves storing, processing, or transmitting credit card data. It's, it's key. For, for the actual entities and merchants uh, or, or you on this call to know these things so that you understand when you're dealing with vendors or you're dealing with uh, other companies that you know exactly what they're talking about or if they don't understand what they're talking about so that you can uh, make sure you're getting these product services or goods that you need and it's not compromising your system. A uh, quick caveat, um, some of you may know this, uh, most data breaches are caused by third parties or by uh, some kind of interface with someone else. 
Um, my favorite one, I don't know how many of you are baseball fans here in the U.S., but uh, uh, one baseball team is allegedly uh, guilty of hacking another baseball team in the pros and, and at the same time causing a data breach now. Uh, I'm sure most of you, many of you may know more about that than I do, but I just found that amusing that um, that's, this is where we're going to uh, as far as technology. So let's take a look here. Uh, section 1, 2, and 3. Uh, section 1 is really going to look at uh, firewall impl impl implementation and is there clear documentation for, for segmentation. And so when we talk about segmenting a network, what we're doing is we're isolating systems and as I said earlier, you want to identify which systems need to be protected because of the data they have in them and what systems need to be protected, but maybe not as as so as, as tightly, right? So credit card information, people's social security numbers, uh, personal identifiable information, things of that nature, you want to make sure you have locked down. Well, PCI really sticks to credit card data, so we're looking at making sure that the credit card cardholder data environment is locked down with uh, sufficient controls and this is one of the tests, is there segmentation, meaning that uh, if I'm in one system in your network, can I access that system where the credit card data is and if I can access it, what do I need to do to do it? So do I need a password? Uh, do I need a username password combo? Do I need maybe a token? Um, do I need multi-factor or two-factor authentication? Um, so for those of you on here, uh, I'll explain two-factor authentication is something you have, something you know, and something you are. And uh, you just have to use two of those. So having a password is something you know. Something you have could be your phone. Some of you use maybe Google Authenticator. Uh, that's what that is. Or and something you are is biometric. Um, am I going to take my thumbprint like I use for Apple Pay or something of that nature? So um, making sure that these uh, systems are protected is, is pivotal. Another one further down here, this has been the cause of quite a few data breaches, is leaving default passwords on systems or not changing the password frequently or not having secure passwords. Uh, this is huge. This is probably, uh, especially in 2011, there was a large uh, a, a value-added reseller that sold POS systems, point-of-sale systems, to pizza shops. And they left the default passwords for their login, and they probably installed uh, 100 or so of these around the country. Well, a hacker found all of them by doing searches on the web and then uh, turned around and, and compromised all these pizza shops. Uh, that, that, that gentleman was uh, apprehended. But understand that that damage to a brand and damage to um, especially smaller companies, uh, especially small and medium businesses in America, is just uh, devastating. So that's what that is about, making sure your passwords are secure. Right? Now, when you look at, uh, you'll see here that the requirements, some of them have changed and gotten new numbers. And what we're talking about in 3.5.2 is really uh, key management, how you're controlling uh, cryptographic keys. Uh, so these are things that we can go into in depth if you want to um, have an individual call because it gets a little specific and I just want to generally give you an overview right now. So here we go. Um, we're looking at uh, expanded examples of open and public networks. Um, let's take a look at this one a little further. So here's a requirement itself, and it's talking about SSL, TLS. This is the big one. This is what everyone is a uh, little has been murmuring about. You see, there's a little bit of information here on on, on mobile, um, and talking about possible open private networks. How you're if you're taking credit cards on maybe a mobile device, and that mobile device is connected to, let's just say, your wireless phone provider. Well, you don't have control over that network, so that is an open public network. Um, and there's a few other uh, instances right here. Maybe you're on the public Wi-Fi on the bus in the morning. Um, 
And if you're doing those things, uh, we know some of it can't be helped. But what they're what you're being told is is that you need to have uh, a strong uh, security posture when doing that. So uh, older versions of TLS, older versions, older versions of SSL and SSH. Uh, I'm sorry, older versions of SSL, uh, which is Secure Socket Layer, uh, are no longer valid. Um, this is something that's going to be uh, that that I've gotten a lot of questions about since this came out um, earlier this month. This needs to be in place by uh, a year from today, uh, and also as of today, no new technologies can be introduced into your network that use the older versions of SSL, any version of SSL, and any older TLS uh, versions. So uh, that, that's the end of that. There's not much more uh, to discuss now. There are a few things that we can talk about um, uh, offline to if you have questions about that, but there's not much more to it as far as uh, how, how the council is viewing it. Now, right here, uh, the next one we're talking about malware and uh, uh, antivirus software. Uh, I had a question about this recently, so I'm going to kind of to I'm going to um, address this here openly because I, I believe the person that asked me is on here. And and here it is, with your malware protection and your antivirus protection, it needs to be updated uh, on a regular basis. I would tell you to use more than one. I would tell you to use maybe three, three different vendors, and you may say that's overkill. But the reality is, is that there's no universal um, guideline. There's no universal way that all the different providers update their virus and and malware definitions. So I would pick the top three or ones that um, uh, you've done some research on and and have a good track record. Now use three of them at one time, and you want to make sure that they are not up. They're not getting updates directly into your cardholder data environment. That's very important. And there's uh, different ways that uh, myself and Palladian can help you set that up if that is a, a problem for you now. Um, so we'll, we'll go further down here. You'll see that uh, there's been a change to 6.1. It used to be 6.2. And then also we're talking about uh, coding vulnerabilities and secure coding guidelines. Uh, this is this is pretty uh, interesting because this is something that's widely been ignored. Uh, how well is your is the coding done on your so on your software, on your website, and are you creating vulnerabilities just by how it's coded? And uh, that has been an issue with with data breaches in the past. And I believe that um, this clarification will help uh, the industry uh, in general. Uh, especially the small to medium businesses who may not even know how their coding was done. So it's a good way to start these questions with vendors that you're using. Okay, so um, the next set of them, uh, of them gets a little more uh, heavy into um, maybe the technological side. And, th and this may be things that only a, a level one or level two merchant um, may, may really look at in depth, but I hope that everyone takes the time to go through this and get an idea of how this will affect their business. Uh, first off, we uh, you want to make sure that you have some good uh, policies and procedures in place. About 50% of the PCI DSS isn't just a technical requirement. It's your policy and procedure, how you uh, just handle things day to day. One of the things that we just talked about is vendor access. We talked about the, the group that had the pizza POS systems installed, and they how they handle that relationship, um, how they handle changing passwords. So this is vendor access for support, um, and there's been a number of changes in this area. But how does your third-party vendors, uh, how do they interact with your system? We all know the story of Target and how it was the HVAC, uh, uh, who uh, the HVAC contractor who was breached first and then the hackers got in the target. So this is something that you want to have uh, some good um, policies and procedures in place as well as contracts, clearly defining roles, uh, who is responsible for what in case of a data breach. So this is definitely a, a paperwork uh, um, 
requirement. Next, next here we have um, distinguishing between granting access to people that are on site, and this is a uh, um, if you have a uh, secure area, uh, people who are in your area in certain areas of your company may need to wear a badge, identifying them as personnel or visitors. Uh, next one here we have audit trails. Um, how well are you keeping track of how people are move and operate within your system? Um, and this is uh, just clarification for all of these. And then the next one here is uh, one of our favorites that most people know about, and that's uh, quarterly vulnerability scans. And um, a caveat to this is you have people talk about scanning, and some people confuse internal and external. Uh, that different requirement is there uh, because it needs to be done internally. Now this one is strictly 11.2.1 uh, is talking about internal scanning and that um, re you need to rescan until all the high vulnerabilities are resolved. Um, this needs to be done by someone who's qualified currently. You'll see it says qualified personnel. It does not say an ASV. Um, and that is a, so that's a business uh, decision on how you want to handle that. And um, you can ask me my opinion on that some other time, but that's a business decision on how you want to handle that as well. And then you have the different requirements here uh, that previously were part of the 12.1 and 12.2. And that's talking more about security policy templates, making sure that it addresses all of PCI requirements. Um, I recently uh, got a phone call from a colleague who said they're working with a company and their PCI policy was uh, one page. It said, we outsource all of our PCI. <laughs> uh, that's a quick way to get you in trouble. Um, and I've heard this uh, multiple times, actually. Uh, you can never outsource all of your PCI responsibility. You may outsource everything to third parties um, as far as processing, transmitting, um, or storing. But if there is a data breach, it does not matter who you outsource to. The owner of the merchant ID is who's on the hook for the data breach. There's no more discussion to that point. That is it. So it doesn't matter what great technology you use. They say, hey, we're going to take you completely out of scope for PCI. That could be true. Probably you'll still have some scope. But the reality is if there's a data breach, your company is on the hook. So. Um, if someone tells me they're going to take me out of scope for PCI, um, I'm going to be on top of them for their their uh, PCI audit every year. Um, just uh, my two cents on that. Next up, uh, we have some other requirements that we're going to look at in depth here. So, and these are the ones we've uh, we've already gone over, but we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, cardholder uh, card flows. I'm sorry, we've gone over these in the past on different uh, webinars, but creation of a card data flow between your system and network. Um, what that is, is it, it, it's just a, a diagram showing how card data should flow through your system, and it should help you identify where it should be and where it should not be. And why that is important is you need to know if credit card data is getting into an area in your network where it shouldn't belong. I'll give you a quick uh, story on this. Uh, a couple years back, uh, the company I worked for in the past was doing an audit, and they uh, came up with a new product. And they said, "Hey, we want to—it's a card holder, a card discovery tool." And they said, "Hey, we want to test this to see if it works." So they went to someone they were auditing, and they ran the software. And come to find out, they found cardholder data in a system that was outside of the cardholder data network. Well. What was going on was there was a very nice lady there who had been at the company for a long time, and she was getting spreadsheets of, uh, of chargebacks, and she was actually filling in the cardholder information if it wasn't already in place, and she was storing it. And it was older data, but it was uh, quite a large amount. So you need to know that, that, that where cardholder data rests, and it could be a policy and procedure issue, or it could be a misconfiguration where it's copying for some reason to a system that's not as secure as where it should be. Um, 
all of these things are, are good to keep in mind. So these are the changes we're looking at, where the, system, where the cardholder data should flow across your network, and more importantly, where it shouldn't flow. All right, so also we have a new requirement for maintaining an inventory of system components that are in scope for PCI DSS. Uh, what that really means is, is that you're keeping an inventory of devices. Um, and I would take it a little step further and I would keep an inventory of devices in version numbers. And uh, you want to keep the device, make, model, uh, serial number, uh, version number of the hardware, uh, maybe possible version of the software that will help you later on with a couple other requirements. And um, you want to make sure that um, you keep that up to date. And that way, if you go into your network and see a device that shouldn't belong there, it's easy to identify. And you can take the proper steps to uh, find out about that hardware. And um, we also, uh, this is one of my favorites, um, SMS is not a safe way to transmit credit card data. There, I said it. Uh, don't send it over text messages, and I think that's all we need to know about that one. Um, no, uh, there are some business uh, models that have used uh, SMS um, to transmit credit card data, and there's just uh, better, safer ways to do it. Okay, so um, malware threats. Uh, Many of the many of the data breaches you hear of start with or or start with malware. Somehow they trick someone into downloading a file that um, makes a change to the system that allows uh, credit card data to be stolen. Now there are other examples of how credit card data is stolen physically with a skimmer, a device that goes onto a card reader. But there there are different ways. Up oh, one second here. When you prepare for a webinar, you think you have everything covered, uh, and you forget to plug in your machine. So let me uh, power that back up so we don't lose each other. Requirements, um, when it talks about malware, there's uh, these are evolving requirements. So they want to make sure that um, the organization is taking malware and software uh, into account. I mean, malware and um, antivirus uh, protection into account. And some people think they're one and the same because maybe they buy it in a package, but there are a difference between the two, and you want to make sure that you have uh, a good, uh, reputable companies. and like I said, I would prefer you use three instead of one. And one second here, and we'll take a look. It's not going. All right, so here's the actual requirement here, and it's going to talk about these are the different testing procedures. So. You want to look at antivirus configurations, including where it's master installed. And you want to make sure that um, it can't be disabled or altered. That's a that's a big one. Uh, one of the one of the uh, breaches that happened that um, we happened to work on in the past. We took a look, and the problem was that the end user had turned off the uh, antivirus and uh, and malware. Uh, protection and they did so because it interfered with a, uh, a, a game that they wanted to play. So uh, these things do happen and we just want to make sure that um, they can only be disabled uh, for the right reason and not uh, just for just for any old reason whatsoever. Okay, so um, <clears throat> right here we're looking at, um, I know some of these are a little bit dry but these are these are good uh, good points to know from a business case. Requirements for coding. Uh, we've we've seen uh, over the last couple of years uh, a very a, a push in the industry for more people to understand uh, how coding, how secure coding practices and rules become important. Uh, Palladian uh, has been in business for for 15 plus years, and one of the things that they do very well is secure coding review. They review code to make sure that it's uh, not opening up vulnerability holes that are unintended or not opening up holes that are unintended by the by them being implemented. When you look at how a system uh, operates, it starts with the code. 
it starts with the software and the hardware working together and then people and processes. Uh, your coding practices could be detrimental to your company or they could be a, a added security feature. You, but most programmers, especially the ones that have been working for a number of years, never take any kind of security classes. They're not taught that in school. It's now become uh, something that's being taught. But in the la and that's new in the last three to five years. And some, some school programs are just implementing it or haven't done it yet. So code review is a, is a very crucial point. And I would actually tell you, if you're using a third party, I would ask them when they got their code reviewed. And it's not um, outside of your responsibility in PCI to check on your third parties and say, so who reviews your code and how often does it happen? And you may be surprised at the answers you receive um, to that question. So next up we have uh, passwords. I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, go through each of these individually um, just because of the sake of time. But to give you an idea, um, in the 90s, a, a password three to, I'm sorry, seven digits, seven characters long, took about three months to crack with computing. Now it takes under two minutes. So the complexity of your password, the strength of your password uh, is very important. Now we're trying to get away from passwords uh, as a society, but they're still there and for the most part we're going to use them in many systems for a long time. So uh, uh, something that I, a piece of advice I give for passwords is instead of using a password, you'll, you've heard this probably a lot, use a passphrase. Um, your, one of your favorite movies, E.T. Phone Home, right? So instead of just writing E.T. normally in Phone Home, uh, use special characters to, to make up the words or use uh, percent symbols to separate each word. Uh, whatever, whatever you can remember, but make it something that's long and, and complicated. Uh, some people use Bible verses. So they'll take something New Testament and then the, the, the book and then the chapter and then the first letter of each uh, uh, word in the actual phrase. Whatever works for you. Um, but do something that will make it complicated for someone to guess your password and change them uh, frequently. It's some people have 90 days, some people have 60 days, some people have 30 days. It really depends on what you're trying to protect. Um, requirements for service providers with uh, remote access is the next one up. And uh, this one is, is pretty important. Um, a lot of the data breaches that we've that have already gone over were caused uh, in part by uh, service providers. You need to make sure that there is solid documentation for um, how they get in to do any kind of maintenance. You also want to make sure that there's solid documentation for how they store that password that they're using, and because most more, more than likely there's more than one technician that'll use it. So you want to make sure that it's stored in a, in a way that's uh, conducive with PCI. You also want to make sure that you have good, uh, a good contract in place that outlines these changes and also any other particulars that are fit the, the, the contract that you have. So what I mean by that is if this vendor is doing your website, you want to make sure that their logins are, are very well defined um, when they go in how they store the data that they that they do have and if there is a data breach who's responsible for what so you want to make sure all of this is outlined and I know uh, most people are thinking well that's uh, quite a bit of, uh, of work but you want to make sure this is done ahead of time because after a data breach you'll find that some third parties may not be too inclined to assist you and uh, PCI Council or I'm sorry the uh, whatever card brand uh, that has ordered the investigation uh, just wants answers so they can get through this. So you want to make sure you have this defined before you need to. All right. So next up here, uh, authentication, uh, token, smart cards. Uh, they must be assigned to an individual user. That's really the biggest evolving requirement. And you want to make sure that they're not handing them off or giving them to someone else or using them at different times. It's anything that has to do with like a a pass to get into your office, uh, maybe a name badge or uh, certificates on your machine, smart cards, things of that nature. 
Um, and we can take a look here at the individual requirement itself. And as you can see here, I'm not going to read everything off the screen, but this is uh, was best practice until today, which uh, now becomes a requirement. All right. So a little bit more about uh, physical access. Um, I, well, I'll give you a quick uh, quick story. I, I used to work for a cable company. I guess to make sure, no, I don't get anyone mad. I won't tell you which one. But I used to work for a cable company, and uh, I would go up to the desk and say, "Hey, I'm here to to fix something." And in larger organizations, uh, sometimes they would not even call to verify that there was an appointment. They would just walk me into the room where the cable came in, and that usually is a room where the servers and a bunch of other information is. And uh, I would do what I needed to do, go out, the secretary would sign, and that would be it. What's wrong with that picture is there's no verification if I really work for that company. There's no verification if you've called for maintenance. And that leads to uh, data breaches and all kind of other, uh, to say the least. So you want to make sure that there's uh, processes, policies, and procedures in place so that you are protecting physical and um, intangible company assets. You want to make sure that devices, uh, another, another big area is skimmers. There's been an increase in skimmers in, involved. I'm out here in, uh, in Utah, and uh, one of the things that happens here is uh, right up and down the highway, which isn't very far from my house, the gas stations were getting hit by skimmers. And what uh, the fraudsters were doing is they would uh, come in the middle of the night, pop open their little van doors so the cameras can't see what they're doing, and they would install skimmers right onto the gas pumps. And uh, some of those skimmers stayed there for months. And these gentlemen were even smart enough to put Bluetooth uh, technology into the skimmers so they didn't even have to go back up and remove them. They just got within a couple feet and downloaded the data out of them and kept about their business. Uh, these, uh, these activities could have been caught uh, much earlier had there been a process in place to check to see if, if, if uh, the gas pump or the, the, the card reader has been uh, tampered with. So that's why this uh, requirement has come into place, and we can take a look at it. Um, one of the things I've suggested for people is to take a picture of the pump um, with the tape on it and make sure the tape is changed so they're different colors or they have dates on them so the tape so they they know what the pump looked like in the morning and you're actually supposed to check these um, on a regular cycle uh, some places are doing it three times a day some people are doing it once a day just depending on um, if this is a, a, a large risk for them I and mean, some are only doing it uh, once a week so it just depends on if this is a business concern, but something to keep in mind. All right, so requirement 10, and I want to leave time for questions, but um, really where we're looking at is uh, some audit log information. This really comes down to um, are you doing logging? How well you are logging, and logging is, is when a change or someone logs into a computer, someone sends an email through your company, uh, there is a, a, a item, an item generated that your security team should be able to review and say, okay, that's a legitimate action in, within my company. If it's not a legitimate action or for users doing things that are abnormal, the logs are where you're going to find out. This is kind of like the, uh, the, the, the front line of your security posture uh, or on the back end. If, if someone's trying to get through your defenses, you're going to notice some abnormal behavior by that user, and that's going to be first de detectable in your logs. So do you have a good system in place for checking uh, the logs and the millions and millions of them that are generated daily in your business? And next up here we have 11.1, uh, which is going to look at uh, your wireless uh, access points as well as uh, if you're doing, if you have proper segmentation. Um, 
wireless access points are becoming more popular in businesses and in schools, especially for people to allow convenience. Maybe you have an in-store app that allows uh, for purchases or some other uh, thing that you have set up that allows for customers' ease. Maybe they can go on si online in the store and download coupons. Uh, the point is you want to make sure that the, there's segmentation and that wireless access is restricted unless it's for if it's the business unit as well if it's just uh, wireless public Wi-Fi. So these are things that you want to take a look at and make sure that you have some kind of methodology. A caveat to this, uh, and I want you to pay attention, that the, the requirement for 11.3 actually uh, talks about NIST. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, and they, that, um, that governing body is now something that's been used to, um, to further uh, scrutiny by the government. So that's something else that you want to be aware of, especially with PCI, that NIST is something else you want to take a look at. But we can talk about that at, uh, if you have a question later on uh, separately. Also, you want to talk, uh, take a look about uh, making sure that the cardholder network, and we talked about this earlier, is segmented and isolated um, from the rest of your your network environment. And to test that, you're going to need to perform, perform a penetration test. Now, some people confuse penetration testing with vulnerability assessment scanning. And the biggest difference between the two is a penetration test is done with an ethical hacker. And it may start off automated, but it becomes a manual testing where someone sits there and pounds away at the keyboard and tries to exploit vulnerabilities. A vulnerability assessment scan is an automated test. And when it's done, it doesn't try to necessarily, well, it, there will be some uh, exploitation if possible, but it's not going to go in depth as in depth as a penetration test or an ethical hacker will. So you want to make sure that um, in the event that segmentation needs to be tested by a penetration test to make sure that it's properly properly in, in implemented. Sorry about that. All right. So um, these requirements we've gone over a little bit already, talking about service providers and how they're handled. So I'm not going to go back into them just yet. We've already talked about written agreements. But be aware that these, uh, especially the one about the written agreement, goes in effect tomorrow. So it's now by tomorrow, and this will be something that will be checked uh, on an, on a level one or level two assessment performed by a QSA or maybe a level two assessment done by an ISA. Um, and they're also um, putting heavy emphasis on making sure that the documentation is clear. And that's something else that if you have a question, you can chat me later and we can discuss. All right. So, timeline. Well, this is what's probably uh, more pressing for anyone else and, and harder to understand because certain requirements have a different timeline. So 3.1 was, re was released in April, and it is effective as of uh, tomorrow. And if you are compliant to 2.0, uh, you have until the end of this year, uh, actually you'll have until uh, next year, I'm sorry, to uh, get on board with uh, 3.1. So that's going to be a bigger leap if you've been doing 2.0 to go to 3.1. And, and you will see an increase in the amount of time it takes. Uh, usually the first year of a new standard, you'll see an increase in the amount of time it takes to get to uh, that level of compliance. And then after that, you will, you'll see uh, for the next two years, it will be easier until you know, the new standard comes out. And if you are currently uh, 2.0 certified as of now, uh, you can see on here it's saying it's ideal to start looking at doing gap assessments to, to look at the changes. Um, that is great advice. Uh, I would actually look at your PCI audit date and start looking at um, what it's going to take to get from 2.0 to 3.1 and start making those ass assessment changes now and those process and procedure changes now because there is a, quite, a, quite a bit more changes than there was in the previous versions. So, and if you're not compliant yet, uh, chat me right away and, and, let's, and let's get to work for you. So I want to thank you today for, for your time and I want to know if you have questions, please uh, feel free to chat them out. Um, 
we are we're happy to field them for you. Or if you want to marinate on it or think about it a little bit, uh, feel free to shoot an uh, email back to m myself or to our host today, Palladian. And please uh, uh, go ahead and you can chat right now. And please, if you have uh, time, go check out Palladian's new website and their branding. Um, it is uh, quite, a, quite a bit of information on there. And a lot of the items that we talked about the solutions that you that you're going to need to to solve these issues are available through Palladian, and um, they they are great people to work with. So any questions you have, feel, please feel free to field them, and I'll uh, take a few minutes and and pause here. see any questions currently um, and so uh, I want to thank you all for your time today uh, we're uh, just a few minutes early and I, I hope you're not too upset about that uh, there was a lot of information in this uh, presentation and if you have questions later on feel free to shoot them back to me directly and I'll be more than happy to assist you with any any that you have. And a lot of these are. And, and keep in mind, PCI is a it should be business as usual. So implementing this into your business uh, and doing it in a way that it's uh, productive and helpful is more important than uh, disrupting business. So if we can work with you and find a way to help you uh, narrow down. Uh, what you need to do and how we can make it fit. That's really what our goal is. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, this will conclude our webinar. And like I said, I'm available for, for questions at any time. Um, you can shoot back uh, back to the, uh, to the login emails you got at Palladian, and we'll be more than happy to assist you. Have a great day, everybody, and uh, I hope, uh, hope things go well.